All right, everybody. It's the Jerry Metcalf podcast where top real estate agents tell how they do it. And today on the show, we have Louise Phillips Forbes with Brown Harris Stevens, 170 years and counting real estate brokerage based. I think you guys are based in New York. Smack dab in the middle. Louise, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's so good to see you. I know, I know. And I'm going to start talking like you by the time we're done because I love that Southern accent. Right. Well, and we'll just start with, you are from, I think, Tennessee. Born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, as I call oh, no. it, Nash Vegas. That market is, talk about real estate and craziness there. It's an exciting market. But yes, I was born and raised and I came to New York 30 something years ago. And you've been an agent for, I think, about 30 years. 32. 32. Wow. So things have changed. So tell us how did, how did it get started? How did you become a real estate agent? Well, like most of us, we come in through the back door. I mean, you know, I think only in the, you know, last decade, people are actually going to school to get into real estate. And, um, you know, most of us come in through the back door. So I came here to, to dance and I used to say 10 pounds ago, it's probably closer to 30, but we don't need to talk about that. And I injured my back. I did some off-Broadway stuff and I danced for two small dance companies down South. And when I came to New York, I was truly a tiny fish in a giant bowl. And, um, but I, I did some work and I, they, I think my first paycheck was $192, which that was not going to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. um, that was for two weeks of work, just to be clear. Even 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I, 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 a friend said, you, you would be really good in real estate. You should absolutely call my friend. She gave me a business card. I called him the next day. I went to go meet him and he's like, you're hired. And I called my brother and I was like, I got a job. I got a job. I'm in real estate. He's like, you know, it's commission only. Right. And I was like, oh no, that's not a job. Like get ready to write a check. Yeah. So, so, you know, I mean that journey, you know, when I went to that particular firm, which was literally two desk, two phones, no fax machine and three, three ring binders that people mailed their listings in wow. there was no computer. And that's just telling you how old I am. Um, well, and, and like a little gratitude for all the resources we have today. In this oh business. my gosh. Especially it's, if you're new. Most of all the transparency with technology, it still needs the wisdom of experience to be interpreted, but the access to that information is amazing. Exactly. So you become, so dancer real estate. Dancer real estate, my first year for all the newbies, I just want you to know I made $8,400. So wow. don't give up the miracles around the corner. <laughs> so that is so true, isn't it? I made $10,000 my first year and I started 10 years after you. So technically that was less just well, to get competitive. That's really, really right. And that's not where we are today. And that no. I came to New York with $800 in my pocket and you know, if you're and you didn't go back, you didn't go back to Tennessee. Not you was Nashville, right? I moved 12 times in my first three years in New York. And by the way, don't move to New York with a king size bed. It doesn't work. My oh, apartments okay. were, were, <laughs> are not as big as my bed. Exactly. So you get into real estate. How, what was that like? Like you've, like you said, you've got the ring binders and there's a phone and there's a little office and you're kind of you know, Southern girl in New York. Well, what was going through your mind and how did you get traction? You know, it, it uh, like I said, that first year was $8,400, but you know what it is? I, I would say that tenacity, I mean, like if I really look back and you and I close my eyes and I will tell your audience and you my truth and that I literally didn't know how to dress professionally. I was, you know, I was a creative person and I was a dancer and I used to work with special needs children doing creative movement. So I never once needed a suit. So I found myself walking the streets in cowboy boots, unitards with shoulder pads, thank you very much, and a prairie skirt. So there's the visual. And, um, and it's really like watching other people to figure out 
take what you need and leave the rest. Like who, who do I want to be? And yeah. so I loved my Southern roots and being casual and over friendly for a lot of people, but what you see is what you get. And so I realized that I had no Rolodex and I would show up at open houses. This guy that I worked for would let me host open houses. And let me remind you when I got into the business, interest rates were 12.4%. So $100,000 cost about $1,200 a month. And, you know, it just was not easy to, the entry into the business is easy, but the entry into earning studies trust is, was not easy. And for me, I realized that it was very easy for me to just give it as a gift. Like my time was really all I had to offer. My knowledge came with time, but all I had was, was my time to dedicate to them. Yeah. And, and that over service earned trust, respect, appreciation. And I was just comfortable in my own skin in that zone. And I was not comfortable at all looking at real estate to be about commissions. It was really for me about being of service. And when I pivoted that thought process and that philosophy of, hey, if I'm an educator and I am of service, then that the rest will come. And it did. And it was really massive traction in a very yeah. short time. I mean, I think when I moved from that little tiny company to, to Halstead, um, which was the next move that I made, uh, I went to go interview at Corcoran and I went to go interview at Douglas Elliman. And I, uh, those managers and those individuals were like, don't tell that story anymore because they said, go get some more experience. You don't have enough experience. But at that time in my third year, I did 200,000 gross commissions and only one deal Every single deal was co-broke. I would call brokers for open listings and say, hey, I have a buyer. I'll never call ever your owner, but would you co-broke this with me? And they would, even though wow. I wasn't listing. And so I had one deal at 200,000. So that means, you know, a 6% commission. I, I made $3,000 and that I did enough in a year to do 200,000 in gross commission. That's a lot. Of That's business. a lot of deals a lot of deals. And I, you, because you talk about co-brokering in, in markets like Atlanta, that's the way we do it. But in New York city, it, it wasn't, we don't, we still yeah. don't have an MLS. We kind of do, but we don't really have an MLS and, you know, deals got quiet deals got done at cocktail parties. And, you know, there were those socialite brokers that would introduce their friends to individuals and they would, you know, buy 10, 1987, $10 million, you know, apartments on Park Avenue. And it was never even on the market. And so that's why I was saying with our technology, it's so great to have this transparent data, even though it's exactly. there's always a story behind a transaction that will give you better insight and subtlety to the market at that time. Uh, it's just great that that's, we have that access now. Exactly. So you said in there a couple of things, tenacity and then trust. So mm -hmm. it sounds like, you know, a lot of agents, even in, in the business a long time, it seems like they're always just figuring out how to get the deal. And you flipped the script and said, no, it's about trust. And recognizing trust is earned. And the way you earned trust was really all you had to give them was your time. In the beginning, I think effort, transparency, you know, I, I, you know, if you treat somebody the way you want to be treated, if you think about my home is where the rest of my life is built from mm -hmm. and to be a part of that process for somebody, first of all, is a total privilege. And, and if I think about the people that are in my life today, I mean, I met my husband through a blind date through one of my clients. And wow, you know, I just think that the fabric of who I am today is built on those people, not those transactions. And exactly. The, their lives and how we've made the connectivity. Um, so, so that's really, I would say for me, 
so much more valuable. I mean, I love making exact. Money. Well, so here's another because you're like this sweet southern woman, <laughs> um, and you but you've been it, but you still got it. You still got it. You southern, your accent isn't as southern as mine, but you still got that sweet, warm way. So coming in this kind of some people use the word cutthroat, but really yeah. the question is coming into it you're coming into this world you don't know you're coming into this city that's not the south and you're representing people and negotiating deals how did that how did you adjust and what did you learn like how did that mold you or how did you become successful mm -hmm. so it had to change you you had to learn things from that what was it uh well I, I noticed early on that whenever I talked about money, my accent just got thicker and thicker because listen, we're Southern. We were raised. You don't talk about money. You don't discuss what you got, what you don't have. And what do you do? Hi, how are you? How much do you have? What do you want to spend? What's your budget? I mean, that's like right. something later. it's still so weird for me. I almost apologize. Like, I'm sorry, but could we talk a little bit about, you know, so I think part of that is that I think that a lot of, particularly men, used to think I wasn't very smart um, because I think they thought that, you know, oh, we need another 5,000, we're good, you know? Right. <laughs> my negotiations, but, but ultimately I think that my casualness was disarming my persistence and really like, you know, doing what I said I was going to do, not one time, not two times, but 48 times, it, you know, people just, they appreciate that. And, uh, exactly. and so what have I learned? I mean, I learned that be comfortable in your own skin. You know, I laugh and I love when I teach like stuff in real estate about how to build your team and how to start your own business. I love saying like, own exactly who you are and don't apologize mm. for it. And, and exactly. And, you know, I laugh at myself with my prairie skirt. And, you know, honestly, I had, I lived on 30 bucks a week. I, that was what I ate. That was when I, you know, I would walk my customers on all the appointments because I didn't have the money to take a cab. And thank goodness you're in a market where you could. Yeah, well, right? I had holes in my cowboy boots, just to be clear. And when it rained, it was not good. But, um, you know, fast forward, you look at all that time in and you look, you look at, you know, all those individuals. I mean, I, I really, it's, it's, it's really amazing because mm -hmm. I do so much business. And so for me, New York, I had to make it very small. I made it small town. I would go into mm. Fairfield and go to the grocery store. And I knew the register guy, like, I don't have any money. I got it. Can I just get some half and half? I'll pay you later on today. And I would pay them, but that's how yeah. I made it work small. I knew my lot, my laundry guy, my shoe guy. And, and I lived in this little world that was like eight blocks. And then I mastered a market one market at a time. I mean, I was like the one bedroom queen because wow. I, I, um, I also, when I didn't have any clients, I would take these select registry books that would be the floor plans of each building. And I would walk up and down each street, like Riverside Drive, West End Avenue, Broadway. And I would learn where the apartments laid in the building. And, you know, another big obstacle, which has turned out to really become my secret weapon is that I'm terribly dyslexic. Oh, um, terribly. And there are a lot of us out and there. And that's your secret weapon, Alyssa. How is that? It is. You know, I was undiagnosed until sixth grade. I had a 45% reading comprehension. Um, and I believe that that period of time in my life, which are such formidable times, really was my groundwork for people skills. I was. Well, you had to. You had to accommodate for not being able to remember what you were reading. I had to distract and didn't know what the hell I was doing. It. Yeah. And in, in every way. And at the same time, my self-esteem, 
you know, I didn't get it at school, but I got it as a dancer and as an athlete. And so that instilled the work ethic. So I really look at those two bookends as, you know, so much of who shaped me in my work world. Exactly. Um, so let's go, because there's a few things we're skipping over and I don't want to miss them because I'm writing them down. So number one, what we're talking about right now is this, this, your challenges create opportunities. Even this dyslexia you you had, right. Even the dyslexia not being diagnosed until you were about what, 10? So how old were you again? It would be like 13, 12. So you're 12. That's kind of a long time and you're having challenges. So you've already been through very- And I only make dyslexic children. So both of my children are dyslexic. So looking over history, there are two things there's this negotiating thing that we didn't really hit on that we're going to go back to in a minute. But first, looking at the challenges you went through growing up, that really, that, it's like to struggle to build strength. You went through some struggles of not knowing why you couldn't read very well until you were 12. That was no self esteem, lots of frustration. So you sure. learn from that. Absolutely. And then you come, you come in and you, learned other things about people because you were compensating. Give us a little bit of what you think, what you took from that. Like if you've got a story, what you took from that and how you applied it to this once again, whole new crazy insecure world. I'm assuming like coming right in the middle of New York city. Totally. So, I mean, you know, look, um, what every, every obstacle, you know, it's just like COVID we can find a million silver linings in oh, that yeah. experience if you if you look in the right lens which means how you choose to look at every situation your glass of water is half full or half empty and so one that attitude adjustment of finding gratuity i mean finding gratitude in hard times especially when you get on the other side of it i had no idea something i had so much shame about that 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 would be my secret weapon do you know that my spatial memory is like rain man that's why developers call me i see oh, wow. differently i i regurgitate numbers like i can remember the fax machine number at one of my office in 1993 i mean it's just ridiculous oh that's so, awesome so it's it's we all have our shortcomings and our strengths. We just, it's our job to find them out and then apply them to make the world a better place and to find fulfillment for yourself. Yeah, we, our shortcomings might be our gifts and it's our job to receive those Absolutely. gifts and use them to make the world fulfill our purpose. Yeah, totally. And that's why I was saying like, own exactly who you are with celebration. You know, do, what you, do what you say you'll do. You said that one too, by the way, everybody. Do what you say you'll do and own who you are. Amen. <laughs> okay, and owning who you are and doing what you say you do, well, you kind of like skipped over this and I have a feeling that there's a story or a few talking about, you know, being that sweet Southern girl coming, of course, obviously I can relate, except it wasn't New York, it was just Atlanta, right? But you're coming into, you're coming into New York and they're often... And I am not a, you know, big on poor me, I'm a woman, I love being female, but there are often situations where you're a little underestimated and you had those experiences. It's funny how they can work to our advantage, but give us a little bit about, you know, do you have any stories or aha moments where you're like, huh, okay, Mm -hmm. this is how to do it. Mm-hmm. Or this is what's going on, or whatever it is. So I, 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 there, I have a lot of aha moments. Thankfully, um, I, I would think that there was an aha moment when I realized that my dyslexia was actually a secret weapon, and that my reason why I remember so many unnecessary but often necessary details was part of a product of being dyslexic, uh, as well as my spatial memory. I walk into a dump of a building and say, no, 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 no. Hold on. We got to do this, this, this. No, we're not building 74 studios. We're building 22. And this is what they need to be. And, and it just is effortless. It's, it's, a, yeah. it, it's really a blessing. So that's a, 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 one of my aha moments. I had an early one in my career where by, I realized that buyers, 
agents are here today and they're gone tomorrow. Sellers are here today and they're gone tomorrow. But my colleagues, my teammates, whether you're sitting at Sotheby's or Brown Harris Stevens or any company, generosity of knowledge and time is a requirement. It, we, we must always give that. And so how many times have you called a colleague and said, hey, I see you went to contract in seven days. Did you go above the asking price? Oh, I can't share that with you. We haven't closed. And I just want to shake that person and say, do you know how important it is for us to share information? Because you are the market right now. And I'm yeah. trying to understand it. Yeah. And so, so that's an aha moment of, of one feeling a responsibility to that um, and, and wanting to kind of shame people into not being that. Well, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem and who wants to be part of a problem? Right, right. Um, I try not to get snarky, but often I might, you know, once I kind of like try a couple of ways to get the information and they're like, you know, listen, we're not closed yet. You can call me next month and I'll let you know. And I was like, no, thanks. That's that, that's that, that's that Southern sass coming out, right? Yeah. What do you think? Well, in negotiating, especially, you know, whether it's dealing with clients or negotiating a big deal, do you have any things that, and of course, that we didn't have this question in advance, but just listen to your no, story. I, I, I mean, listen, yeah. I, the do you have anything where like, like everybody thought it was going to go one way because they didn't see you coming? I, I think that, you know, the aha moment, what I was yeah. just saying, I'm going to add to before I go to the negotiation. Oh, please. Yeah. That, that, you know, I was one of the first brokers in the nineties that had a team that had people work for me. And I wish I could have had the opportunity to go to the couple of people that I really admire and work for them and make all of the mistakes that I made that took seven years. I would have done it in like two years or maybe less. That being said, I decided as I watched some of the crankier older gals, and I'm calling it saying gals because they were primarily gals that were snarky, not kind, barked orders, get my coffee, do the, you know, and, and I was like, you know what? I hope I can climb to the top and just be freaking nice all the time. I'm yeah. not, always, I'm not always, but I always want to be approachable. And I also wanted to make sure I took time to help people like, Hey, I see you went into real estate after dance. Can we meet for coffee? Yes. And I probably yeah. brought 70, 80 people into the business. And so, so that translates to the negotiations, those 70 or 80 or a hundred cups of coffee that I've had. And now they're brokers that are seasoned 10 years later and there are five offers on the table. They're calling me first to say, you know, we, here's what I, I need you to do. We have five offers and, you know, get me no contingency and I'm going to do my best for you, but put your best dollar for, you know, they're not betraying any confidence. Yeah. Well, isn't it amazing how fast that five years goes by? Like you're having that coffee, you're doing something nice for an agent. And next thing you know, it's five years later and you're up front because of something you may not even remember you did. I mean, I think that's the whole philosophy of like, we should be the best versions of ourselves every moment because you never know. I mean, you know, my mother, I'll never forget the conversation I had with her where I said to you earlier, you got to give it away to keep it. You know, we have to be generous of ourselves in order to, to um, if you always give away your knowledge, you will have that much more. And we always have something to leave individuals and something to take. So even if it's just smiling at the, the sanitation guy and thanking yeah. him. Yeah. That, and I'm thanking him because I'm not walking over a garbage bag because he's doing it. And it's just really trying to. Yeah. Well, it's, it's more that creates more, not less. Yeah. Abundance versus scarcity. Yes, indeed. And, and from the negotiations, listen, I think that I've always had a philosophy that there's each side has a story, meaning 
their truth, that owner is, you know, you can't always share when you have a owner who's going through hardships and, and, and mm -hmm. needs to do, have this, 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 but you can have some empathy. And my job as the voice for my buyer is to understand exactly what those needs are. And I'm obviously my job is to get the best I can from mine, but picking the battle strategically with your buyer on like, look, we can get, we have to do this. This is going to be the most important thing for them. They need it. I mean, they, this is where they raised all six of their children and they have an emotional tie to it. So the number is going to matter. Yeah. And, and, and so you start with, with what you understand from your colleague on the other table and you, you, you arm yourself with that insight. It's, listen with empathy. Yes. And I also think that I always, it's funny when, you know, people, I've, I'm sure you've been in the a situation where you make an offer and it's 300,000 below the asking price. They're like, I'm not even going to give that to my seller. They're not, just don't mm -hmm. even, don't even right. bother. Never. Yeah. And, and instead it's like, listen, doesn't matter where you start matters where you finish, you know, it matters that you start yeah. and finish, finish too, but you can't finish if you don't start. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, the art of the negotiations for myself is really, um, I don't do negotiations in an email. I only do by voice. I'm, and I'm, because you Absolutely. look so much on inflection and, um, yep. and people's state of mind and what, what, you know, you have so many opportunities to plant seeds of information and insight and, you know, uh, data is, is, in itself great, but it's so much more powerful when it can be interpreted and tell the story with the with the professional. Well, people don't see data, they hear stories, they make decisions on emotions, and mm -hmm. you can't really listen to an email. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know, maybe they have this di the dictation tool, but I promise, right? We both know, we all know listening to this, that it's not the same. That's it's not negotiating. A, That's and just I, I always do as per our conversation, emails boom 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 absolutely great point always follow up in writing but something you're saying i'd love to know because you've got this whole world of everybody who's afraid of technology taking over and it seems to be less and less the case and i would say the difference is computers don't listen mm -hmm. they don't empathize and as people fewer and fewer agents are appreciating and recognizing that and those that's why I think, I think it used to be like 20% of people did 80% of the business. And now it's 5% of people do 95% of the business. I, agents, that wouldn't surprise people me. Agents, but we are people that wouldn't surprise because me. that's who's listening. And if you're not listening, technology will take over and you won't, the, the good ones will get it or you'll lose it completely yep. to whatever yep. the discount yeah. portion of I our think, business is or discount. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. Walmart or Saks or better. Yeah. Right, right, right. I, I just think that um, that also comes with generation. I think it's really, you know, I, I worry I have an 18 year old and a 16 year old and, you know, they're so techy, which is great, but, you know, really teaching your children, teaching your teammates, your millennials, like you can't text them. You need to pick up mm. the phone and you need to call them. And, you know, it's just, I think it's really our responsibility. I mean, you know, uh, to keep those simple, basic, you know, kind of go back to the basics or keep the basics. Yeah. Intermixed with your technology. Well, and the greatest message for me just listening to you is it's amazing the little things like picking up the phone when it's right. Some people want to communicate by text, but there's most moments where a conversation is absolutely necessary and the ability to actually have a conversation. There's actually a skill set to that makes yeah. the biggest difference in your success and where what happens and where things end up, especially when you're negotiating. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, listen, we, we did in, 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 in climbing markets, like everybody's like, Oh, you must be loving this. Like I, hate it. I hate 
myself being under that stress because I do 99% of all my business is personal relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I've sold them nine apartments. I'm selling them another one, whatever the case, you know, but executing with personal relationships, you know, frothy markets during a pandemic is crazy. just crazy. And so I, while I love it, um, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not my happy place. We did 19 <laughs> transactions in three weeks, which was super Wait, how many transactions? Say that again. How many transactions in three 19 weeks? 19 transactions. 19. Which totaled around, around 70 million. Maybe it was a little bit more than that. And, Same. Um, and, you know, I, I, most of them had more than one bid. And, um, and so how do you manage that? I, I find that multiple bids, this kind of market, particularly selling, you know, when you were representing the seller, those agents, like we have six offers, I'm not showing anymore. It's like, excuse me? I'm sorry, wow. why, why are you not showing? Well, I'm really busy. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. And so I think that that sort of being of service mentality exactly has to be, has to be in existence for every yeah. And um, so I, I, you know, and I, and I make a point, especially when it's not easy and I don't have to quote unquote, I think it's really important to always make the effort. Like I was just texting before we got on with a woman, I can't show on Saturday because I'm going to my kid's football game. And so I literally am calling her to tell her all about the apartment. We don't, we always escort in our, in, in the city where you all sometimes have the key boxes. I hate not being a part of a showing because I really think that my personality is exactly. And I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I don't wanna sell it. I wanna share about it because anyway, I'm, I'm making an, an effort. I'm called my owner to ask him if I could show, leave the key with her, with the doorman. And I wanna go through all of that. And I, I think that again, best that that effort that i'm making for her will come back tenfold if Doesn't not it? From her from somebody exactly. else new agents and and old agents like you know effort equals appreciation exactly it really does it's amazing the things you could do and you're like why am i even doing this this is i just because i just am and then it always always the momentum the compound effect of it so team, you said earlier, you had one of the first teams in the market in New York, I mean, like in real estate and in New York City. How did you know? What was that like? Did people think you were crazy? How was it structured? Well, what does it look like now? Um, well, I, I think that I, I shouldn't say team. Um, when people had people work for them, they were assistants and they got them coffee and they made copies of things and they, you know, answered the phone. And, and it's not what we see today. Mm -hmm. uh, where assistants are actually rock star brokers that that started new and and have morphed into a role and so for myself i had one or two people that that worked for me but i really realized that i couldn't service and i couldn't service all my business and you know i i i mean i would say that probably one of my best years is 200 and 60 million. Um, wow. yeah. and, and you realize that we don't just, we go through board packages. So you have to put together, you have to kill like three trees. And it's like applying to a country club where you have letters of references and business references and tax returns. And, you know, they look up your skirt all day long. And yeah. that process takes so much time and effort. Um, but what I realized in, in, for my team, and again, this goes back to me observing some of the ladies that used to not be very nice, is that I didn't want mini me's. I wanted individuals that complemented all my weaknesses because I got a lot of them. I have a lot of strengths, but I got like a lot of weaknesses. I mean, I am technologically challenged. Um, I mean, I have to dictate a lot of my emails because of my dyslexia. Yeah. So 
understanding that, you know, I hope and my goal was always to create a machine where everybody spoke makes a difference. And um, so I, I believe I pay people who work on my team. Everybody gets a piece of everything. Oh, Whether wow. Touch it or yeah. not. And that's awesome. I, I wait, you said, it. wait, everybody on your team gets a piece. Meaning or not. I have all the salespeople, whether they have anything to do with the deal or not, okay. they participate. Yeah. Some percentage. Um, because I wanted to promote, I, first of all, I, when you have 45 listings during the pandemic, which I did, mm. um, 25 buyers, I didn't give a damn what I did. I just had to figure out what I needed to do. And so I really wanted all for one and one for all. I wanted it to not matter who did what. And I wanted us to try to find balance in this crazy world. So I try to rotate it where I work on a weekend and then somebody else works on a weekend and we rotate it. So I felt that it was really important to find balance within, you know, the volume of business that we do. And I, and, and really I, the process of how I, I prefer hiring people that are not in the business. I would rather them be new. So I cannot, I don't want to undo habits. I don't want to make somebody's own experience wrong. Mm -hmm. I want it to just like, Hey, let me just tell you why I'm doing this. So and, before, I don't want to interrupt you, but I don't want to lose some good stuff. I don't Go want to bypass it. it too much. Find balance in the volume you do and doing that with a team. So many teams are an agent doing a lot of business and there are people that are hired and then there are other people just kind of running around hoping they win, hoping they make it. And that's kind of it. But you, the point of a team is we all do more together and do better together. How do you, when you, could you give us a little bit on like how many agents, how many admins, what does that structure look like oh, to make sure yeah, it works? Listen, I, uh, I had the same team for eight or 10 years for many, many years. I mean, I had a PR marketing person. I had a business manager. I had a team assistant. I had at 1.5 agents. And um, what else did I have? I had an operations person. And, um, and they really were really exercising. They were executing on my relationships. They were not bringing in their own business, which is kind of unusual. Yeah. Um, and, and I think what I realized in 2018, when some of my team members uh, left and very abruptly and not with the kind of integrity I would have liked to have seen from them. Now this um, was agents or? They were agents. Okay. Agents. And, um, you know, I think that what I realized I did was that I didn't hold them accountable for expanding our business. You know what I mean? Like I had this platform of $200 million that I could no way, I, there's no possible way I could do it by myself. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as our business. And when you go and you have a listing that you show 87 times and 35 of those are direct buyers, why are we not converting those people? Yeah. I'll open house and I'll meet 12 people and I'll have three new buyers for us. Yes. So I wasn't teaching that number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, um, I found that I was literally having to restart and, and, and keep, keep them invested because they really weren't entrepreneurial. They were doers. Great. Yeah. Doers. Yeah. But you want, I, myself, I want to watch my teammates grow. I want to watch them grow with conquering their own listings and, you know, converting a buyer and qualifying a buyer. And how do they do that? And we do, I must do 50 conference calls a week with customers that we're sharing with each of the people who work with me. And, you know, it's, interesting to like hear myself leading them through that and then to listen to them have their own conversation 
that they take what they need and leave the rest because I'm going to have that my own very unique way of spinning my shtick. Yeah, and yours is going to be different. But yeah. they took what they needed and left the rest. So it's, it's it's really fulfilling to experience. So number one, it's when you're building a team. Well, first of all, you've got agents and kind of admin support people. You have both. And you talked about in growing a team to make sure it works. The lesson you've learned is always make sure you bring team members, especially the agents, you teach them to grow mm -hmm. and make sure you've got doers is good, but they've got to be entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think that that it's interesting now. I, I only hire and, and this is new. I used to do it a long time ago and I don't know, it fell out of my brain, but um, I only do. I do personality index tests for anybody that I hire because I've also come to learn in the past that I've put people in positions that they were turning themselves inside out, trying to be something that they're not. We are innately. I mean, my, my relational, my, my relational score in a personality index doesn't even re register on the, it, it spikes off of the chart because that is what makes me tick. That's what wow. fulfills yeah. me, which yeah. is I'm clearly in the right business. Yeah. My husband says I even care about bad relationships. Um, like, why didn't she like me? I don't understand. I, I mean, I was so nice to her. You know? No, you've been an agent for 32 years. Surely you've learned that one. I've learned that one, but and I can relate. Yeah. So, um, so Bill, you know, and I also will say that, you know, Barbara Corcoran, we were talking about Barbara Corcoran. Yeah. Earlier. She invited me to the Pierre for breakfast one morning. And I don't remember how many years ago, it was before she sold the company. And Pam Liebman, who she is the CEO, was with her. And we sit down and she is, if you've ever met Barbara Corcoran, she is just a hoot. And her energy is off the charts. And um, and I what I love about her as a leader, and I shared this with you, is that I feel like she was one of the first women in real estate to put brokers she did things out of the box and yeah. she, she put brokers first truly before the company um and anyway she sat down with me and she's like okay wheeze what are you drinking so i got a coffee and she's like okay so what's your gci what's your da 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 what's your average deal how many deals have you done this year da, da, da. and i was like i went home and i was like honey i don't I told my husband, I don't, I don't, I don't really remember. It must've been 12 years. At least I was in the business and I was not calculating my numbers. And my husband's like, honey, we need to do that. So I did it that night with my husband and, uh, I had, <laughs> I think that I had done 112 transactions, a hundred and wow. $138 million. This was 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and you know, then I started focusing on, I could then set goals like, oh, my average deal is 887,000. And I would go, I want it to be 3 million or, you know, I then had to start to realize when I was doing so much business, anything below 750,000, I would refer out, but I would refer out very selectively yeah. to match the individual to the business because I, I just can only do so much. High level of service and attention to detail. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Knowing your numbers, a lot of people say, well, I don't need to know my numbers, but you need your numbers to know where to best allocate your time. Mm -hmm. And then when it was a referral, make sure you know what to refer and referring to the best people. So you're serving and oh, by the way, that results in a little income. Yep, yep. I, th I think also the other thing is that that knowing my numbers, I think that some of the agents, sometimes agents don't appreciate when you have a team leader that creates the momentum of business and the underlying operation. I mean, at one point I had two, yeah. drivers, two drivers, not one, but two drivers and you know, an operations person and a PR yeah. person and a marketing person internal and a team assistant that costs money. Yeah. I mean, really, I had to make like over a half a million dollars just to come to work. Yeah. Yeah. And that helps, yeah. it helps to provide empathy 
or um, insight for your agents when you're coming up on your reviews and you're talking about what, what you know, what, what are your goals for earning next year? And, you know, it's an opportunity to remind them that it's not just up to what I'm, I'm giving you to work, meaning your, your, your base, your base salary to work and benefit from. Yeah. The momentum is going to be your springboard and it can be exactly what you make out of it. And I'm here to make it amazing. Which that's the kind of thing most real estate agents pay for, by the way, mm. rather than have a seasoned real estate agent pay for it. The privilege of being on a team like that, I run my team similarly, so I'm relating, but the privilege of having a team like that, they're pretty rare. I would assume they are in Atlanta. I mean, not Atlanta, I'm in Atlanta. I would assume mm -hmm. they are in New York as well. Well, yeah, I think that again, it's why your personality has to be the right, you know, when you, when you have a setup where you are prepared to give somebody a base piece of all your business, which by the way, is representative of 32 years of my life. Yes. Um, and you, and you give them opportunities to convert other business and to um, bring in their own relationships yeah. that you give and invest time on you know, you still have to have an altruistic personality. You need to have an individual really entrepreneurial, but you need to have that personality where I need people to be givers as I am because the taking is a natural. I mean, yeah. so that, that is, I think it's really important that, um, you know, I've made, I've made a lot of mistakes, a ton of them. And, um, some that I had a lot of parts to do and that I've learned from, and I am grateful for, you know, humbly understanding what I, what I, what was my part and why something wasn't, didn't go the way I had anticipated, but most of all really to, to continue to hone the opportunities that I want for myself, but most of all for my team and the culture that we have. So question, what like in talking about, cause we all, the best way to learn, the more mistakes you've made, the more successful you are, as long as you, depending on how you respond. Yeah, depending on if you pivot that mistake. <laughs> right, as long as you like learn from it. So in saying that clearly you've learned a lot, what have you learned on the topic of teams team structure and leadership. What is your biggest lesson and advice on the best team, the best structure for a team and the best leadership of a team for success? Um, I would say that, wow, there are a lot. Um, my, my, the, the hardest lesson I learned was finding the balance between my way and how I could learn to do things differently. Like change is so hard for me because of my dyslexia mm -hmm. and, and gratefully I'm so open about it that me having to hand write an email to somebody and somebody type it for me doesn't piss people off. They understand that it's just so much easier for me. And, um, and, and also again, I am the essence of my voice. I really want to come across in the words I choose. And, mm. and so, so, so my biggest lesson, I guess, has been how to, how to find the balance of giving everybody in a, a voice in my team. And um, I don't care when people don't, when people make mistakes, I, I, I mean, that is, I think that those are opportunities to learn, but I have a very high bar for myself. And therefore I know I have a high bar for individuals who work for me and finding out how to make that the personal connection much stronger so that, mm. so that we know, I, I always try to assume best intention. I always think rigorous transparency is imperative, which is why I share all my numbers to my team. They know what we make. That helps them. That's, a, that's like building that trust. 
And I didn't always operate that way. So. Yeah, well, it's a few, it's, you hold a high, because a lot of what I'm hearing is what so many of us real estate agents, we're control freaks. Mm -hmm. And we realize the stakes are high. When you're in real estate, you're spending a lot of money. When you grow a team, now it's not just me, it's other people. And you're, you're basically like, you're making a bet on people you bring in on, you're, you're, you're betting on them and you're believing in them. Most which of is, all, I'm investing the only commodity that I don't have more of, which is time. <laughs> right. So when you do that, it's you hold, you hold a high bar, but you can't not. Mm -hmm. So bringing transparency and diffusing the tension without killing the necessary detention, a detention, attention. Yeah. To make it happen. Yeah. So I, I don't know how other people do it. I don't, I don't really want to know. I just, I would much rather err on generosity. Like when my teammate, after working in a different industry and the most money he had made was $78,000. And when he broke $200,000, I literally almost cried. Um, because I felt like I had a little something to do with that. It was yeah. all his hard work. And I say to people that I, I'm interviewing and I'm talking to, I am not looking for a one and done. I'm looking to give people a career. And I would be naive to think that somebody's going to be with me for 10 years, but it's happened. And I'm hoping I can provide the fulfillment, the excitement, the knowledge entering in a market at this level, because there are not very many people that don't know me in the city. And that's from hard work and years, time in. That's awesome. All right. What is, you're talking about mistakes. What can you give us? Like, what is your best lesson learned? Oh, geez. Um, hmm. Which one is that? Um, my best lesson learned. Hey, give us your top three. <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of them. I, I, I think that, that, that I, I mentioned this before, but I think that, that it's the same as my aha moment, um, realizing time and time again that buyers and sellers are here today and gone tomorrow and that our team, our, our industry colleagues will be the key to so much of our success mm -hmm. if you are generous and support them and and ask for their support to you so that 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 was a mistake that i made early early on when i got into uh develop my first like development project where i thought i was the key the be the queen bee of whatever and it was just a moment in time that i was just having a incredible run on this building and i just don't think i was very nice and i don't think that's acceptable so so that was that that, that was a big lesson i think uh knowing my numbers and sharing my numbers uh as a team leader i think again helps it it's it's a level of trust i mean yeah. i have people who i've interviewed who've worked for people for three years and they're like I've never talked to the owner. I was like, what? No, she won't let mm. me email them or call them. I don't even get CC'd on emails. I don't have their contacts. I'm like, what? Wow. Yeah. How do, you, how do you function without like, so you just know like little pieces of crumb and you, how, right. do, you learn? how do you learn without an open book? Yeah. And so yeah. my team has full access to my email. They have access to my contacts. They have access to my docs. Because, you know, I have been betrayed, but I can't imagine altering my life so that I have to change being like this. Yeah. I, 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 can't, I can't withhold. I don't even know how to live like that. Exactly. All right. So we've already been talking for almost an hour. We always finish with the final three. Can you, I, I need to pull my shade down a smidgen because the sun and that's kind of, you look like an angel. It's kind of cute. Like you've got the, it's like the halo is coming out. Okay. Oh, that's going to be too dark. Well, no, that's good. That's good. That's Thanks. actually, I think that's going to be good. Oh, that's right. perfect. Okay. So we're going to do final four because I have a special question for you. So first one, 
of in the in this industry who would you say is your greatest mentor or has been hmm. does it have to be in the end does it have to be in the no end? actually no um, well let's see in the industry who is i i gotta probably say diane ramirez all right was the ceo of halstead and um one of the most elegant which was the brokerage you were with before they merged yep yep yep. right and okay. uh, she is she is the kind of individual that just makes you feel at home every moment and like that she's so happy to see you very elegant she's she always makes other people feel like a million dollars so i hope wow. that can be something that I make get it, yeah you make people feel like a million dollars why not mm -hmm. and, come, and also everybody just reiterating coming from a place of service and working with people always yep and when that pivoted in your business all right next question what is a book well no 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 that's actually the next last we gotta ask this one first what do you think has been your most powerful resource in building such a successful career? Which by the way, this is going to be in the intro, but we haven't talked about it in this interview. You've done over 4 billion in business and it sounds like you're going to do another billion just this year. Yeah, so no, anyway, no. 200, that, 200 million, but we're probably pushing 4.7. So almost $5 billion in business. What do you, what would you say has been your greatest resource to achieve that? Um, my greatest resource to achieve my level of success. I, I, I think, I think just owning exactly who I am and honestly, gosh, that first you part, answered it on who you I, are. I couldn't do it alone. And I think that just like raising a child, it takes a village. It takes a village to execute the privilege of do, finding somebody their home and owning owning who you are what well, you just you said three now sorry okay no no don't apologize i need to shut up and let you finish i mean owning who you are and and embracing you know i like to think that my passion and my love for people is contagious i don't want to promote myself i want to attract and mm. and i and I also, I do believe in my heart that it is such a privilege to be a part of this chapter of people's lives. And so it takes a village. And so for me to, I'm only as good as everybody on my team allows that to be because we do it together. Mm -hmm. On who you are, remember you're not doing this alone. Mm -hmm. and embrace and appreciate the privilege of what we do amen that would be i would say absolutely the three things that i would attribute because it's also it's like it's a philosophy and an attitude um it's not about the transaction it's a it's about the people mm -mm. absolutely i always say don't anchor yourself in the object of the transaction anchor yourself and what you do and what your client really needs and helping them know what that is right exactly book is there a book that we've just got to read or that you've read and completely altered your life oh my gosh all um i have a We're just really good is enough <laughs> uh well you know i um i i love um the power of now at cartel a um, it's it's an oldie but a goodie and um and i also i like feel good books i like you know people who pulled themselves up by the bootstraps you know i i did tony robbins in 1992 when i was in my cowboy boots and creative visualization and all of those things, goal setting, I never knew. I didn't even know that. I mean, and I was an athlete, so I set goals, but I didn't know how to do that for business. Power, yeah. And and I yeah. also say that there was something called 
um, you know, I grew up with parents that were parents from, they were from the depression and my dad was born in 1916 and my mom in 1926. And I had a, a weird relationship around money because I like, they say mm. rainy day. And so I read a book um, that was money is my friend. And it taught me to change my perspective and my relationship with money. And so I, it was helpful in my business because I'm super generous. I don't, you know, it's like, it's only money, you know? And like, if I go meet somebody, I'll buy them a cup of coffee. It, it just, it shifted that abundance um, instead of hold on to, hold on to. Yeah. But it was just an interesting, that was a long time ago. So I'm not, I'm not giving anything that's, you know, yeah, but, I love that. but what you're talking, I think so many of us, maybe the older ones of us, or maybe all of us could relate to that. Cause I used to be in that place. Of course, I'm far from it now, or you don't know that, but to your, money is my friend I hear and you. the power of now my boy at Cartole. I love at Cartole. Um, He's so yeah. such a great one. Okay. Last but not least, if you want us to remember one thing from this interview, if we happen to forget everything else, what is the one thing you would say we've got to take away? Or you hope to remember? Oh, let's see. Own, your, own, own who you are because there's so much business out there and you know, there's a shoe that'll fit all. And so your clients, I just think that's, that's really how to celebrate yourself because there's, there's a shoe that'll fit all people. And I used to kind of was trying to figure out myself as a chameleon and I just not, I just, I just love for all my better and worse and my good and my bad. I know my intentions are always stellar and own who you are with your dyslexia, with whatever your stuff is, because I think that that's how you stand out. Mm -hmm. Don't let the world mess out on you. <laughs> and they're going to if you can't own it if you can't own who you are amen louise amen. louise phillips forbes thank <laughs> you so much everybody with brown harris stevens in yeah. manhattan in new york city it's so awesome to have you on the show my time was my privilege for you thank you thanks for listening to the jerry metcalf podcast where top real estate agents tell how they do it if you like this episode, please share it with friends. To find more episodes, search Jerry Metcalf Podcast on any platform for podcasts or go to jerrymetcalfpodcast.com. That's J-E-R-E-M-E-T-C-A-L-F podcast.com.